Preston Foster. Since 90 event catches the attention of every Pacific yacht race, this is the story of one of those races and the almost incredible chain of incidents that beset one particular boat. This is the siren's call. Song of Lorelei. For untold centuries, it has beckoned man to the sea. It is the excitement of sailing a ship in the vast expanse of the ocean. The tug and pull as the canvas billows full. The struggle to keep her under control as though she had a mind of her own and was rebelling against mere man directing her course. The siren's call. The sea, challenging man's ability as a seaman. That defiance is never bolder nor more eagerly accepted than in the Transpac race, Los Angeles to Honolulu. More than 2,000 miles of ocean, of wind, currents, and the elements, daring man to pit his skill and his luck in a race against time. This is the story of a magnificent schooner, the Goodwill, and its crew who answered the siren's call only to find themselves pitted against the strangest variety of adverse conditions ever encountered in the Transpac race. second time the Goodwill raced in the Transpac. Her first effort was in 1953, and many of the 52-man crew had participated in that event. But there were new hands, too. Old and new alike turned to and getting acquainted with a 161-foot Goodwill for this 1959 Transpac, and in polishing up on becoming expert seamen. What manner of men were these who could temporarily forsake the comforts of home and everyday living to embrace the hardships and discomforts of life at sea? To them, the Transpac was more than plunging this ship of power and beauty into the challenges ahead. It was more than being first across the finish line at Diamond Head. There was a burning desire among all hands to better an elapsed time record set in the 1955 Transpac by the catch, Morning Star. Nine days, 15 hours, 10 minutes, and eight seconds. A record many believed would never be broken. But you couldn't convince the men of the goodwill of this. Long before the crew prepared to put the big schooner into tip-top shape, schedules were established, job lists, and assignments were firmed up. Nominations were made. A policy was established, and weekend work schedules were settled. It was also decided that all standing rigging would be replaced. Orders were promptly given to sailmaker Ken Watts for a new mainsail. It would represent a 5% increase, or 750 square feet, over the old mainsail, making a total of 5,300 square feet. In 1953 Transpac, Bud Gardner had designed a new sail called the Titzel. For the 59 Transpac, the Titzel would be larger. Wind studies were conducted to verify the significant advantages of the bigger concept.
The first weekend work assignment began on March 14th, almost five months before the start of the race. That weekend was the real test of the fiber of these men who had accepted the challenge of the Transpac. It was almost a clean sweep down four and a half. All the standing rigging was cut down. The Higgins power boats, davits and working sails were removed. There was chipping and painting to be done and welding in preparation for the new gear waiting to come aboard. Normal weekends were things of the past, for preparing the goodwill was the key to success if the Morning Star's record was to be better. Now the schooner was ready for her new gear, and aboard it came. Two spinnaker poles were hoisted aboard to support 11,000 square feet of nylon. In all, approximately 30,000 square feet of sail was to be used with the gollywobber itself, accounting for 8,300 square feet. There were myriad tasks to be done. This was priceless experience, and every hand knew he was participating in what could be, perhaps, a once-in-a-lifetime adventure. It was incomparable as speedy corps as the goodwill was prepared for the big race. When the big schooner was declared ready, the severest tests of all began. Practice runs in which the crew had to learn firsthand the tremendous forces involved in racing a craft the size of the goodwill with all sails set. the shakedown cruises were to Catalina, past which the Goodwill would plunge on her way to Honolulu. On these trips, the abalone were plentiful and delicious. Every weekend through the months of April, May, and June, the crew learned to become a part of the big schooner, to make her respond to their wishes and to thoroughly acquaint themselves with the emergency procedures developed especially for the race. Families and friends of the crew. 
This was their opportunity to witness firsthand the lure that had attracted these men for many weekends. They too became imbued with the fever of the race and the high hope of bettering the Morning Star's elapsed time record. On June 25th, 10 days before the race, the Goodwill was placed in dry dock where the final painting assignments and other tasks were accomplished in the terminal phase of preparations. The propeller was removed to eliminate drag. It was stored aboard to be used on the return trip to the mainland and the propeller aperture was sealed. In the Transpac, only the sea, the wind, and the skill of the crews would send the fleet westward to the goal. From the outset, because of her size, her rating, and the resultant handicaps, it was apparent that winning the Transpac was almost impossible. The only incentive was to beat the Morning Star's record. On the morning of July 4th, the day of the race, cameras recorded the entire crew dressed in the traditional red for the port watch and green for the starboard watch. The steering committee wore white uniforms, while personnel not assigned to watch were dressed in blue. Once at sea, these garments would be discarded for dungarees, shorts, and skivvy shirts. All the weeks of work, learning, and preparing were now at the point of culmination. Every man was keyed for the thrill of the race in the hope of setting a new elapsed time record. They were ready, and they knew the goodwill was capable of doing the job if the seas and the winds would cooperate. If anything, the sun seemed a bit brighter than usual that morning, and there was absolutely no breeze. Thus, this magnificent schooner, her canvas secured, had to be towed toward the starting line to rendezvous with the smaller craft of the fleet. Thirty minutes before the start of the race, a light breeze began to make up. The tow lines were cast off and the goodwill proceeded on her own toward the starting line. After reporting to the Transpac committee boat, the big schooner jived back toward the lured end of the line. The breeze began to freshen and the goodwill, coming down on a reach, hardened up on the starboard tack for the start just as a number of smaller boats on port tack were approaching the line. The goodwill, having the right of way, would have forced the other boats about. But at that moment, a starting gun sounded and sailing master Don Douglas Jr. threw the helm hard over, thus avoiding confusion at the start. For thousands of spectators on land and aboard sightseeing craft, it was a thrilling start. One they will long remember. There was no turning back now, no chance for second guesses. The Transpac race was underway. Originally, the Goodwill's course was planned to pass the east end of Catalina Island, but reports indicated dying winds in that area. Cheered by ever-increasing breezes to the west and the strong pull of the new mainsail, the steering committee, composed of Don Douglas Jr., Ralph Larrabee, John Herndl, Bill Slater, and Bud Gardner, decided to pass the west end of the island. The difficult task of tacking a boat of this size, maneuvering the fore topsail and the number one jib in order to set a new course, found the goodwill running last. But by the time she passed the island, she was back in the thick of it. That first day, her speed averaged 7.58 knots. She had covered only 182 miles, was 13 miles behind the pace she established in the 1953 Transpac, and well behind the Morning Star's position of 1955. By the end of the second day, the goodwill had taken the lead. She was averaging better than 11 knots and was ahead of her 1953 position. The breezes were good, the seas moderate, and the morale of the crew was high for the goodwill was not far behind the Morning Star's record. In all her majestic grace, the goodwill moved well ahead of the fleet. The 8,300 square foot gollywobbler had been set. The mainsail, main top, titsail, and the ballooner were full. All hands marveled at the surge and pull as the canvas captured and held the breeze. With things going smoothly, there was time for a hand or two of cards by the off-watch. 
even fancy footwork, the likes of which may never be seen again. Comfortable bunks were provided for the crew to rest weary muscles. Owner Ralph Larrabee's penchant for excellent food delighted the crew. Incidentally, three corporation presidents served as chefs. Optimism continued high on July 7th, the third day out. The Goodwill was now about a third of the way to Old Diamond Head. She was 88 miles ahead of her 1953 position and just about even with the Morning Star's record run. Each morning, the Coast Guard Cutter Dexter radioed weather conditions and each boat would report its position. This was accomplished on the same wavelength for all boats of the fleet, enabling each to plot against its competition. Also on a daily basis, Transpac headquarters kept an accurate account of each boat's status. Thus far, the goodwill was well ahead. Having thus buoyed the spirits of the men, the sea gave its first hint of a capricious mood intended to test the skill and patience of the crew and the gear of the goodwill. The morning of July 8th revealed that a low pressure area was moving in. An ominous portent of things to come made itself known when the after guy at the end of the spinnaker pole jumped from its ship. It had parted and both ends whipped back across the deck. The spinnaker had to be lowered, but no amount of pulling would accomplish the task. And in the worsening seas, it was too risky for a man to be in such a precarious position. The device developed by Jim Douglas would have to be utilized. There was an explosive bolt fired electrically from the helm. The firing released the pressure and the crew hauled in the sail. The other pole was rigged and the goodwill was on her way again. But her forward progress had been reduced to an average of 9.8 knots. Despite the difficulty, the goodwill was at about the halfway point, and chances were still excellent for bettering the Morning Star's record. But the sea had just begun to present its weird assortment of tricks. It rained all day. Not the usual squall, but continuous rain. The gollywobbler was pulling like a freight train. The heavy seas had reduced speed to an average of 8.6 knots. Then at 3.30 on the afternoon of July 9th, it happened. The main topmast had snapped. Forty feet of solid fur, one foot in diameter and weighing approximately 2,500 pounds, was swinging like a giant pendulum, smashing into the mains, causing the big schooner to shake and quiver. It was a terrifying experience watching that giant club crashing into the rigging 100 feet above the deck. Despite the heavy blanket of boom that descended on the entire crew, a damage control party was quickly organized. Kerry Pruden and Lynn Smith volunteered to go aloft. The wildly careening mast had to be harnessed. Every man knew that should it fall, it most certainly would crash through the deck. There wasn't a moment to spare. It required three or four valiant efforts, but the pole was finally caught in a web of lines running between the two masts. The wind guide and the anemometer, which had been positioned atop the main topmast, had now lost their value, and these weathermen faced the grim prospect of duty in the galley. It wasn't until 10.30 p.m. that the broken mast could be lowered to the deck. The number two and three jibs and the foresail and foretop were put up. The goodwill proceeded at seven knots. In the past 24 hours, she covered only 157 miles. On the morning of July 10th, still fashioning a weird assortment of conditions, the sea, in direct contrast to only a few hours earlier, was almost glassy, and wind was almost non-existent. The goodwill in losing the main topmast had lost the titsail, the main topsail, and the gollywobber. In all, 10,550 square feet of high canvas that would catch a breeze even when very little was evident near the water. 
He proceeded at about seven knots under the pull of the ballooner. Her plight was reported to the Dexter, which informed the crew that several ships of the Transpac fleet had suffered dismasting, broken poles, and lost spinnakers. In addition, the Dexter in its morning report now referred to the Goodwill as the Catch Goodwill, and the crew enjoyed a good chuckle. The Gollywobber was recut by sailmakers Gardner and Littleton, planning to spread it from the shortened mainmast to the foremost mast. It required almost 24 hours to repair the Gollywobber, but a decision was made not to hoist it since the Genoa used by the Morning Star in 1955 and hoisted that morning by the Goodwill was pulling well. Aware that vital time had been lost and the Goodwill was falling behind the Chabasco and the Constellation, the crew was directed to send the schooner further south in search of better winds, which should have filled the sail some time ago. It was a gamble, but our only hope. On July 11th, a big schooner reached the influence of stronger winds. Diamond Head was nearly 700 miles in the distance. No chance now to better the Morning Star's record. But there was still a possibility of crossing the finish line first. Two boats were now ahead of the Goodwill, in particular, the Chabasco, but they were well to the north. With the stronger winds and a bit of luck, the Goodwill had an outside chance of finishing first. Even under the shortened rigging, the Goodwill registered 14 knots and more on several occasions particularly in the few but heavy squalls that struck the area. As if chagrined at the Goodwill's ability to overcome all obstacles, fate had one more challenge to hurl in the schooner's path. While making 14 knots and doing a job in which the spinnaker pole was elevated, the winch holding the pole topping lift broke. The pole fell into the water and going aft, struck the foremost port shrouds, snapping the pole in two the longest portion falling overboard alongside the schooner and slicing the ocean like a huge pontoon. The drag of the broken pole on the Goodwill's forward progress was a problem, and after several efforts, the severed portion was hoisted free from the water and lowered aboard ship. of July 14th, the Dexter radioed that the catch, Goodwill, was once again in the lead. But the fast-moving Chabasco, still to the north, was not far behind. The trade winds continued to freshen, and the Goodwill began reaching for the finish line with her huge ballooner billowing full. An F-86 buzzed the schooner as if in salute. took hold as the island of Hawaii appeared on the horizon. The winds were holding as evening set in. It was steady as she goes. All hands were flushed for the prospect of being the first of the Transpac fleet to pass old Diamond Head. On the evening of July 14th, and during a heavy rain squall, the Goodwill scudded across the finish line. In spite of her difficulties and almost 30 hours of light wind, the Goodwill had crossed the line first. The Chabasco pressed the Goodwill into the final days of the race, it was second almost 10 hours later. For the Goodwill, it was not victory in the true sense of the word. She had not bettered the Morning Star's record, but boat for boat, the Goodwill had finished ahead of the fleet. When the sails had been lowered and the Goodwill was anchored at Alawaii, the welcoming committee was ready. The first to finish boat always draws a big crowd and for the first time, the members of the crew began to relax. There was deep thanks that despite the adversities in gear and weather, there were no serious casualties. It had taken the Goodwill a little more than 10 days to complete the Los Angeles to Honolulu run. In 1955, the Morning Star was blessed with strong and consistent winds, ideal conditions. All hands agreed her record appears almost impossible to beat.
But, as it has been for centuries, the song of Lorelei is still out there. And it is plainly heard by those who have answered her enticing melody. The siren's call, luring man to again test his skill as a seaman against the challenges of the sea and the wiles of the elements. For having once heard and answered that call, man can never forget it. Perhaps one day that call will become strong and clear enough to be irresistible. And the vow of the goodwill again will slice through the Pacific as the Transpac fleet races for Diamond Head. <laughs>